Father, we are so thankful for life in Christ. Without Christ, we have nothing but death. We have nothing but hope and fear of condemnation. In Christ, we have the very experience of life itself. Even before eternity, we have a, a quality of life, a quality of existence that only you could give. And that quality of existence is to be free from sin's dominion, its rule, its power over us, to have the shackles of our sinful nature to have been broken, to, to be able to rejoice in obedience, to be able to see our heart bend in directions that are toward you and toward obedience and toward righteousness. This is life, and we want to thank you for our life in Christ. Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, I do pray that you would quicken our ears, our hearts, and our minds. I pray that you would give us strong encouragement when our ministries and our service and our, all of our areas of responsibility, whether we are parents, in our marriages, in our workplace, in our classrooms, and in our church ministries, I pray that we would find incredible encouragement from this text this morning. Fuel within us, Lord, an incredible heart of gratitude, a gratitude to you that would transcend and surpass the circumstances that we live in, that would even surpass the fruit that we may or may not see, and that would surpass the results that we would long for with regards to the gospel and with regards to those whom we love. I pray that you would be glorified by a heart that would remain faithful, humble, and full of gratitude, even when ministry is difficult. And so we, um, we ask that you would answer this prayer for no other reason than for you to glorify your name through this congregation. And that would be more than enough for us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> I want to just say, first of all, before we dive into the sermon this morning, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Anderson family. Thank you for um, ca calling us out here, and thank you for inviting us to be part of this body, and, and thank you for your friendships. Thank you for your encouragement. Uh, we, we've been loved on you and, and so uh, warmly received by you, and we're very, very grateful. We are already indebted to you, and uh, it is just really a, a joy and a privilege to, uh, to be here. Um, I, you know, just want to say, maybe I could say it this way, you know, this morning I'm your preacher, hopefully soon I can become one of your pastors. I, I think, uh, you know, one of my prayer requests in this season has been, you know, Lord, give me, uh, give, give us as a family like the, you know, exponential speed in getting to know everyone, and um, we, we long for that to happen, and you know, it just takes time, and, I, and you and I both know that. But we're praying that the Lord, by his grace, would speed that process up and uh, that it would happen faster than naturally possible. And uh, I think the Lord's answering that. But I know it's a difficult se season and a very interesting season for, for all of us. And so in some ways, that kind of slows that down. But um, nevertheless, we are super thrilled to be here. And we really, really look forward to getting to know you and your families. Well, I want to just turn our attention quickly to God's word for the sake of time this morning. Grab your Bibles and open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. I really have been enjoying Romans so much, and so I thought about just doing the next passage. But uh, then I knew I'd have to face Smed when he got back from Northwest Community. He's teaching up at Northwest at Scott Christmas's church up there, and, and uh, he'll be back this afternoon. But uh, he asked me to teach this morning, and I thought this passage was something that I had just been reading through in my own reading of God's Word and, and um, refreshed me once again. And so I wanted to come back to this text uh, because it is such a powerful, powerful text. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 14 to 17. Verses 14 to 17, that last paragraph in chapter 2. Follow along with me. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved 
and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. I titled this sermon, Thank God Even When Fruit is Unseen. Thank God Even When Fruit is Unseen. I remember about a decade ago, I'd been involved in ministry for uh, six or seven years, and it's one of those seasons in ministry where all of my labors and all of my efforts seem to be turning to dust. Uh, in, in the course of about six months, I probably saw about three to four dozen individuals leave our church, if not leave the faith. People I'd poured into, people I'd labored to serve, I'd prayed for their spiritual growth, uh, they'd been in my home, I tried to teach them scripture, I tried to encourage and exhort. Uh, I'd even seen some make initial responses that were positive to really hard commands in the scriptures. And then it was just this season where it just seemed like everybody, it just the, the trend was just leave. <laughs> And it seemed like everybody that I poured into and everybody that I was lo- had, had labored for to see Christ formed in was going in the opposite direction. It was incredibly discouraging, uniquely discouraging. And you all know if you've served the Lord any length of time, this is not some unique phenomenon to formal pastoral or preaching ministry. This is just Christianity. You probably had a season in your own Christian service, your own Christian ministry, where you've been very burdened by what you perceive as a lack of fruit. Maybe a season where you're laboring for extended family, or maybe a particular friend at work, or maybe just your own children, maybe your own spouse, and you're longing to see Christ formed in them, and you're longing to see fruit robust fruit, the kind of fruit that only the Holy Spirit can produce. And the more you labor, the more you strive, the more you pray, the more you open up scripture, the more you articulate, it just seems as though there's less fruit if there were any to begin with. And fruit can seem so hard to come by. And It's not wrong, let's just be honest, it's not wrong to want fruit. If we don't want fruit, something's wrong with us. But let's also just be honest and and, and admit that there's something more important than fruit. Namely, being faithful to Christ in our own hearts. Christ is worthy of our worship, even when there is no fruit. But I'll be honest, I can speak from experience. When you're in those seasons where you're not seeing fruit, those are the periods of your Christian life where giving thanks to God can really be the hardest. It can seem excruciatingly far from our, your heart's capacity to be giving thanks to God if you have labored for faithfulness and you've, you've, you've strived, strove <laughs> with all your might to just be faithful in front of your children and then you say, well, where's the fruit? Are they going to follow after Christ? Are they going to embrace the truth? Are they going to count the cost? Are they going to tremble at God's word? And when there is no fruit On the horizon, that season can be excruciatingly hard. And giving thanks to God in that season can seem impossible. But Paul did. If you paid attention when I was reading that paragraph, you might have heard the title and said, wait a minute. Because I know that you're good students of the Bible. You might have said, wait a minute, there's nothing in that paragraph about unseen fruit. Explicitly, Paul mentions fruit among the, those who are being saved and an absence of fruit among those who are perishing. But he doesn't say anything explicitly about unseen fruit. And this is one of those paragraphs, that, I mean, any, every paragraph needs to be read in its context, but this paragraph especially is critical to be read in the context of 2 Corinthians. And before we dive into verse 14, I want to just give you a little bit of background here. 2 Corinthians, it's actually the fourth letter that we know Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. 
He wrote one before our first Corinthians, and that would have been a letter that gave them some instruction uh, that they were even confused about. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he refers to that letter, and he talks about, when I wrote to you, this is what I did not mean, and he clarifies some things, which, by the way, is interesting. If you're in equipping hour, this is free for the sermon. For you who are here for the sermon, this is free. But in equipping hour, we've been talking about God's clarity of speech, and it's fascinating that if you read the Bible cover to cover, the only time where you find an inspired writer who had to clarify, it's 1 Corinthians referring to an uninspired letter. Isn't that fascinating? So we have a letter before 1 Corinthians. Then you have 1 Corinthians. Then you have what's called the severe letter, and he talks about that in chapter 2 of the second epistle, what's called 2 Corinthians. He talks about a severe letter that was between some visits that, that uh, happened after 1 Corinthians. And so now this ends up being the fourth time he's written to them. And he's about to come visit them for the third time, as he says in chapter 12 and chapter 13. In this particular letter, we just read the first paragraph of a massive parenthesis in the middle of the letter. So just, if this is helpful, just to get your mind around what Paul's doing, from chapter 2, verse 14, all the way through to chapter 7, verse 4, there's this massive parenthesis in the flow of what he's doing in his letter. And let me show you why that's the case. Let's go back real quick and look at verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2, just before where we just read. In verse 12, Paul writes, Now when I came to Troas for the, for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened up for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Now, hold that thought, those two verses, keep them in your mind, and skip over to chapter 7, verse 5. Chapter 7, verse 5. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. What happens in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 is Paul says, look, when I was in Troas, I had an opportunity for the gospel, and then if you read it in Acts chapter 16, there's the Macedonian vision. God gives him a vision and says, of a Macedonian man saying, come and help us. So he says, look, I'm sitting here in Troas. I don't know how the Corinthians are doing. I'm really disturbed and concerned about how they're going to respond to my ministry. God calls him over to Macedonia to minister for the gospel. And so he leaves and does that obediently. And then he launches from chapter 2, verse 14 to 7, 4 in one of the most grand descriptions of the privilege of Christian ministry in all of Scripture. And then in chapter 7, verse 5, he goes right back to Troas and Macedonia and says, okay, so anyway, when I was in Macedonia, I was really encouraged because Titus came. And not only was I encouraged because Titus was there, I was also encouraged because he told us how you, Corinthians, were responding to my gospel ministry. And I was overwhelmed to hear him say, they mourned over their sin, Paul. They responded positively. Now, I've deflated the balloon here. I kind of pulled the surprise out from under you because we know where he's going in chapter 7, verses 5 and following. He is thrilled about how the Corinthians have responded. But what's profound is that before he even gets there, the pause, the parenthetical, explain how Paul could give thanks even before he knew how the Corinthians responded. He was ministering in Troas. He was ministering in Macedonia. And he kept ministering. He kept faithfully getting after it. He kept serving the Lord. And he kept writing letters. And he kept praying. And he kept exhorting. All the while, I can only imagine battling the cynic within. <sighs> They're not going to respond. They're going to blow me off. They're going to blow off truth. They're going to disregard Christ. They're going to follow the Greco-Roman orders. They're going to follow the Judaizers. <sighs> he doesn't do that. When he has no idea how they're going to respond, he thanks God for the privilege of ministry. He thanks God for the privilege of ministry. 
Paul was incredibly concerned about the Corinthians. It's not that he's so distant and so impersonal that he has, he's not wrapped up in it. He describes the anguish at the thought of loved ones not responding to the truth. He describes a litany of sufferings he experiences in 2 Corinthians 11, and the, the climax of that is, and who, who, what concern is there besides you and your sin? I mean, to think of the churches in sin is the greatest suffering Paul experienced. So he's very affected by the response of people to the gospel. But the point of this paragraph is, Paul's able to thank God even when he doesn't see the fruit. Can you thank God? even while your children are still in unbelief? Can you thank God for the privilege of parenting them? Can you thank God even while family or friends are still in unbelief? Can you thank God for the privilege of ministry when you're trying to labor in the church and fellow Christians, fellow church members aren't bearing the fruit that you would long for? Are you able to thank God for the privilege of being a ministry of Christ on their behalf? Paul does that in this paragraph, and it's important that we understand how. This is incredible theology for us so that we can remain faithful and that we can please the Lord even in those fruitless, apparently fruitless seasons of ministry. So, as we walk through this paragraph, I kind of just outline it by, by giving you three reasons to thank God. Even when fruit is unseen, thank God. And there's, there's three reasons here. Starting in verse 14, thank God that he leads us in triumph. I'm going to make a quick comment here about these first couple of points. Notice in verse 14, it says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Verse 14 contains the first two reasons. But notice that it's not stated in the way of Paul saying, hey, thank God for this reason. He just says, thank the God who does these things. So these first two reasons for thanksgiving just simply happen to be Paul's description of God. This is how he's thinking about God in very dark seasons of ministry, apparently fruitless seasons of ministry. Theology grounds thanksgiving. Your view of God is on display in how you respond when ministry is not effective or apparently ineffective. He starts by saying, but thanks be to God. So here he is, ministering in Troas, ministering in Macedonia. He has no idea how the Corinthians are responding. And he's still just thanking God. He's thanking the God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Let me explain that so that you can appreciate why Paul is giving such profound gratitude to God for this reason. That he leads us in triumph. That word triumph is a technical term. It's a term that the Corinthians would have been very familiar with because in their culture, in the Greco-Roman era, a triumph was a formal celebration of, of a military accomplishment. In the period of the Republic, according to Josephus, even functioning, uh, the functioning Senate of, under the emperor, you would have... Um, uh, generals coming back who were victorious, and they would become a candidate for a triumph. A triumph would be a, a massive, massive celebration. And, and to be a candidate for a triumph, there were several, several criteria. Uh, number one, you have to have been the actual commander in chief in the field. So you had to be actually in charge of the forces. You couldn't have just it couldn't have just been a dispatch that you sent off and some guy went over and won some skirmish. He, you've got to be the guy in charge, the commanding officer of this entire army, of that entire battle. So commanding officer on the field. The campaign, number two, must be completely finished. It can't be in process. It has to be resolved, successfully resolved. You can leave soldiers there to keep the peace, but it can't be undecided yet. Number three, 5,000 enemies must have fallen in a single engagement. So, I mean, this is like, you know, really, really, like, <laughs> carnal. This has got to be like a massive showing of superiority and power and might to give you a candidate for a triumph. Number four, territory has to be gained. You actually have to expand the borders of, of the empire. This couldn't have just been some local uprising or civil, civil skirmish. It has to have expanded the borders of the Roman Empire. Number five, the victory must have been over a foreign enemy, so not a, not a civil war. 
And so there's several, several criteria that are necessary for you to be a candidate of a, of a triumph. And what would happen is if, 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 it's, if it passes and they hold a triumph in, in your honor, what would happen is a massive celebration, kind of like imagine a, a Macy's Day parade, a Thanksgiving Day parade. You know, it's just uh, imagine some massive show. Um, Josephus describes a triumph that involved... Um, uh, footmen carrying massive displays, and it sounds like a float in a parade, and it would be three or four stories tall, and people would act out even scenes and of skirmishes and battles that were involved in this triumph, and so they would reenact it. He also describes that they would often, the Roman army would often execute a lot of its enemy, but they would keep alive the highest ranking officers, the tallest and strongest men and the most attractive individuals, and they would bring them in the triumph as a demonstration, as a show of the people that they triumphed over. So it was a show of, this is who we conquered. We are superior over these people. Then they would march all the way through Rome to the Capitoline Hill. And if you've ever been to uh, Rome, you know where the capital is. Uh, it's, it's right up that hill. It's the, it's the hill up just above the Colosseum. And so if you've been to the Colosseum, you've seen that hill with all the ruins. That's where uh, Caesar lived. That's where a lot of the, the government buildings are still. You can see the ruins of the uh, government buildings on the Capitoline Hill. And so the triumph would end there, and they would go up on the Capitoline Hill, and they would offer sacrifice in the temple to Jupiter. The, it's interesting, if you've been to the Colosseum, by the way, if you've seen Titus's arch, that's the, that's the arch between the Colosseum and the hill, um, it's celebrating Titus's um, triumph. Titus was a Caesar, but you, rem- you, you might have heard about, you, you, you know what happened in AD 70. Jerusalem was sacked by Rome. Well, Titus was the general. So he actually earned a triumph for the, what he accomplished in Israel. And if you go to Rome today and you look at Titus's arch, you can see a, engravings on that arch of Titus's triumph. And if you look closely, I don't remember which side, one of the sides has a picture of, of uh, men carrying the candelabra, the seven-fold lamp, seven lampstand, out of the temple. That's actually engraved on the arch. So this parade would have gone through. There would have been reenactments of victories. There would have been the conquered soldiers. There would have been um, the officials who were the, would then punish the, the captured individuals, and then they would actually bring them up and execute them at the end of the triumph. There were musicians, there were priests with incense, and then there would be the general decorated in purple. It was a pompous show, and it was to show superiority and significance and greatness and grandeur and glory. And Paul just kind of steals that motif. And he says, you know what I can thank God for? I can thank God that he always leads us in triumph in Christ. And he pictures things from a different perspective than looking at fruit and, or its lack of, apparent lack of fruit. He looks at ministry when he's still uncertain about how is this going to be responded to? How is this last exhortation going to be re- responded to? Is it going to be embraced? Is it going to be received? Is there going to be fruit? Is there going to be softening? Is there going to be a turning And he says, I thank God that he always leads us in triumph. He sees God as victorious no matter what. And he sees himself as being led in this triumph, victorious in Christ. Why is that image important? He's going to pick that back up here in verse 15 in just a second. But quickly, look at the second reason to thank God when fruit's unseen. Thank God that he displays Christ through us. Thank God that he displays Christ through us. What's necessary to see here is that he introduces the smell of Christ. It says he manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And then he's going to say in verse um, 15, it's a fragrance of Christ to God, and then in verse 16, an aroma of death to death and an aroma of life to life. And we'll get to that in a second. But here he just talks about this sweet aroma. We become the sweet aroma of God, of Christ, as God leads us in triumph in Christ. It's fascinating when you read some of the accounts of the triumph 
Often uh, people would line the streets and they'd want to see these stage displays being carried down and the, the reenactments in the battle and they'd want to see the captors and they'd want to see the victorious army and they'd want to see the general. they want to see it all. And so they would just line the streets and they'd often throw flowers out in, in the street. Now, Paul doesn't say anything explicitly about flowers, but I would like to just, uh, just take that as an image for you for a second and just think of the smell of flowers. He's picturing the image and the aroma of this triumph and he's saying it's the aroma of Christ. It's the smell of Christ. And where he's going to go on the next point here, he's going to point out that it doesn't matter if you're the victor or the captor, it's the same smell. But thank God that he is making Christ known. He's manifesting Christ, the smell of Christ. He's permeating the world with the scent of Christ through us. That's, that's a big test, isn't it, parents? You see your children, you see people you love, and you see them not responding to truth. And has God done wrong? Is he obligated to save? Does he have reasons not to? Why is he doing what he's doing? At that particular point, really our worship has to be demonstrating that it's more important for us to manifest the knowledge of Christ than to get the fruit that we desire. Is it enough for us to manifest Christ? Third, Even when fruit is unseen, thank God that, that we smell like Christ. Thank God that we smell like Christ. And here's where Paul properly gets to the, the reason for his thanksgiving. Verse 15. You could literally think of the, the, the connection between verse 14 and 15. This would be a very literal rendering of the Greek. But thanks be to God, verse 14, verse 15, that we are a fragrance of Christ. Thanks be to God that we are a fragrance of Christ. So let's just start generically. We smell like Christ. And I chose a very neutral term, smell. Because Paul uses two different terms for the scent or the smell. And this is actually very fascinating to me. So I was looking at this text, I remember being blown away in verse 14, the NAS has sweet aroma. Verse 15, it has the word fragrance. And then in verse 16, it has the word aroma, and then again the word aroma. Now, what's consistent here is the word aroma. In verse 14, it says sweet aroma. That's the same word in verse 15 as, I'm sorry, verse 16a as aroma and 16b as aroma. Those are the same word, same word all, all three times. And let's just call that aroma. And then in verse 15, it has a word that's not neutral, like smell. It's a very positive, and so it says fragrance. And it's actually a compound word in the Greek. It has the word, you know, you, which means like euangelion, means good news, the gospel. That's where we're going to get the word evangel or evangelical, gospel, good news. It puts that same prefix on the front of the, of the smell, so it's a good smell. It's a pleasing scent. It's a pleasing aroma. It's completely positive. You couldn't even use it in a negative context unless you were using it ironically. It's just a positive term. And he only uses the explicitly positive term with regard to how Christ smells to God. Interesting. Look at verse 15. For we are a pleasing fragrance, a good smell. We are a pleasing fragrance of Christ to God. That changes everything. Do you realize, don't you, if you smell like Christ, you are always pleasing to God. It doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks of you. It doesn't matter what your child thinks of you. It doesn't matter what your spouse thinks of you. It doesn't matter what your coworker thinks of you. If you are pleasing to Christ, if you smell like Christ, you are pleasing to God. It's a good fragrance. It's a pleasing fragrance. Thanks be to God that we are a fragrance of Christ to God. 
And Paul is sitting there in this vertical moment of just appreciating the fact that I know ministry is hard right now, Lord, but the fact that I get to smell like your son and that that is always pleasing to you is enough for me. That is what he's worshiping, not the fruit. That's what he's worshiping, not the fruit. Thanks be to God that we smell like Christ. And to God, that's always a pleasing fragrance. But in 15b, he switches and talks about how we smell to man. Talks about how we smell to man. And he switches his terms. He says, um, he says in verse 15 for a second, go back to 15, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So it's not indifferent to the fact that we are among people and there's a horizontal element to how they respond to the sweet fragrance of Christ to God. It's just that all that matters is I'm among people and I always have this pleasing aroma to God because I smell like Christ. And then in 16, he picks up the, uh, the, the horizontal element and he says, okay, let's talk for a second about those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And he explains that to man, we are an aroma. And so you need a more neutral word like smell, aroma. It's not pleasing fragrance. It's the neutral word. So smell is a smell. You can use it in different contexts. You know, you walk in, you walk in somewhere, and you say, "Oh, what's that smell?" You can just, it's just dripping with it. It does not smell good. You can hear it in my tone. Or you walk into a bakery, and they just finished another batch of incredible pastries, and you say, "Wow, that smell is amazing." And you can just use the word smell. It's neutral. It depends on its context. You can go swing it either way. And so here, Paul uses this word, it's neutral, it's translated aroma, and he says, yeah, we are a sweet fragrance to God, and we are an aroma to man. And it goes both ways, doesn't it? To continue his metaphor of the Roman triumph, the flowers that would have been thrown in front of the soldiers, it smells the same to the victors and the captors, but to one, it's victory. To the other, it's death at the Capitoline Hill at the temple dedicated to Jupiter. Paul says, verse 16, to the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Wow. Wow. We smell like Christ, we're pleasing to God, but when you smell like Christ, you're, you're an aroma to man, and that, 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 that's going to produce a wildly opposite reaction, is it not? Scriptures are so powerful, I've, I like to call them, they're magnetic, they always attract and repel. There's no neutrality with the scripture, there's no neutrality with the truth, it's always attracting or repelling, it's too strong. Here, using the fragrance element, Instead of like a magnetism illustration, here he's using fragrance, and he's just saying like the, the, the aroma is too strong. It's, for one, it's, it's the aroma of life to life, and for the other, it's, it's an aroma from death to death. Now, why does he say from life to life and from death to death? I think the best way to understand that prepositional phrase is just simply, it's like you think of a spectrum. You know, like if you're describing a, 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 a bad smell, you're like, oh, I don't know, it's somewhere between like wet dog and stinky socks. <laughs> you give like a spectrum, and so Paul just gives a spectrum. He's like, well, on one end of the spectrum, if you're perishing, it smells on the one end of the spectrum like death, on the other end of the spectrum like death. From death to death, that's your spectrum. To people who are perishing, I don't care who you are. If you're perishing, Christ smells like death. And if you are currently being saved, the fragrance of Christ, it's somewhere on the spectrum of life over here to life over here. I don't care who you are. If you're being saved, Christ is the smell of life, from life to life. There is no spectrum. <laughs> Starts with death, ends with death. Starts with life, ends with life. And so Paul says, this is who we are. We're ministering a pleasing fragrance to God because we smell like Christ, but at the same time, when we smell like Christ among those who are perishing and among those who are being saved, to the one we smell like death, to the other we smell like life. And he's able to thank God for that. Is knowing Christ and making him known enough for you? We must truly worship Christ to be able to present Christ to those that we love. And they need to hear the truth 
There's no such thing as preaching the gospel without words. And I know the phrase, preach the gospel when necessary, use words. No, there's no preaching the gospel without words. But it's also true that more damage can be done by getting words right and not living in a way that proves the gospel. And the best evangelism must start with a heart that's content to be pleasing to God because it's content to smell like Christ. That has to be more important than the fruit. You know, I remember, I believe it was um, Spurgeon's mom who said when Spurgeon was young, if you die, he was in his unbelief still, if you die, Chuck, or whatever she called him, when you die, Chuck, I'm going to side with God against you. That, that takes, that's a mom with 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 17 in her veins. Picture this reality, Christians. If you know Christ, you walk into a room, you walk into a house, you walk into a um, conversation, a new friendship, a relationship, you walk into opportunities for influence. Everywhere you go, you are the fragrance of Christ. And so horizontally to man, you're an aroma. And you'll always be an aroma. You can't be pleasing to God without smelling like Christ. And if you smell like Christ, you are always going to produce opposite reactions among men. You're either going to smell like death or you're going to smell like life by being one and the same, truly faithful to Jesus Christ. Are you okay with that? And this is really where our hearts get tested, isn't it? Because at times we see uh, just a, such a longing and such an appropriate longing, a spiritual informed mind that loves the lost and loves our family and loves people we want to minister to. And we get grieved and our hearts get heavy because the cost gets great. And to continue to be faithful and to say the right thing and to keep standing for truth, it just can become relentless. And Paul models for us what faithfulness looks like because he just kept thinking, God, you know what though? If I keep smelling like Christ and I keep producing that response, that means I'm still pleasing to God. There's no place I'd rather be. But when we lose sight of that, we actually might be tempted to go down a path or an avenue that tries to cover up the smell. We might become apologetic. We might become concerned. We might, become, we might lose our boldness. We might start covering some of the whole counsel of God because we don't want to offend and we might say, I don't, I don't want them to, to, to know that I stink. And so we start deodorizing. <laughs> start deodorizing because we're, we're aware of this relationship or this cost or the relational equity that we might lose over here and it starts to affect our fidelity to Christ. Not Paul. His faithfulness to Christ wasn't up for grabs. He knew he was going to be faithful. He knew it might cost him his relationship with Corinth, but he said it anyway because he loved them and because he was compelled to be pleasing to Christ. And so when you think about everywhere you go and in every relationship and opportunity for influence that you have, you smell like Christ, you realize, wow, what odor, what fragrance are people getting? What, what do they think Christ smells like? Am I an accurate representation of Christ? Far from changing the odor... I need to be faithful to, who, to what Christ actually smells like. And if, you're, if you smell like Christ, you have every reason to thank God, regardless of how people respond. But I understand that this is a tremendous burden. Paul asks the question we should all be asking right now at the very end of verse 16, and who is adequate for these things? Are you kidding me, God? Think about this for a second. People, some people might only know of Christ through you. Whoa. Wow. Who's adequate for this? Who's adequate? The word means sufficient, adequate, large enough, fit, appropriate, competent, qualified, able, you might think it's a rhetorical question, and he's just going to say, no one. 
But ironically, in verse 17, he says, well, we are. What? He's going to say, we are. But before we look at verse 17, skip down to chapter 3, verse 5. He says, but not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God who also made us adequate. His adequacy is only God-given. But the question still remains in verse 16, who's adequate for this? I mean, everywhere we go, we are a fragrance of Christ to God, which is always pleasing, and then we become, by, by default, an aroma to man. And to some we smell like death, to others we smell like life. Eternity is being turned upside down or cemented every time we open our mouths if we speak gospel truth. This is so sober. This is such an intense, no, no wonder Paul is saying who's adequate for this. And so in verse 17, he says, it starts with the word for. And this is going to explain how he knows that he is a pleasing fragrance of Christ to God and how he knows that he is the aroma of Christ to man. Because let's just be honest. If you get this wrong, people will still think you smell like life and death. It's just that those who are perishing will think you smell like life and those who are being saved will think you smell like death. So the simple fact that people would have opposite responses to your life and ministry is not enough. Because if you get this wrong, those who are perishing will smell you and say, hey, it smells good, it smells like life. And those who are being saved will smell you and say, this smells like death. But if you get it right, it's flipped. And those who are being saved will say, you smell like life. And those who are perishing will say, you smell like death. So how do you know? The basis for that statement comes in verse 17. For we are not like many. If, you're a, if you write in your margins of your Bible, you could just write the many on the margin there. We are not like the many. That's what Paul says. He gives it the definite article. We are not like the many. Isn't that helpful, by the way, to just know that in Paul's day, the same arguments just continue, uh, that continue into our day? In Paul's day, people would look at what true ministry was supposed to look like, and they would just look at the many. Well, everybody's doing it that way. In today's day and age, <laughs> everybody's like, wait, why, why are you saying that's the gospel? Or why do you do ministry this way? Or why do you think this is, I mean, everybody else is doing it this way. Well, guess what? If you're, if you're on the narrow way, you're in good company, because Paul says, we're not like the many. So next time somebody says, well, nobody else does it that way, say, good, look at 2 Corinthians 2.17. 2, <laughs> we are not like the many. So what is it about the many that, that gives him proof that he is actually smelling like Christ? How does Paul know that he's smelling like Christ? Well, here's the negative. It's, he knows that he, doesn't, he smells like Christ because of a negative. Fortunately, he is not like the many who peddle the word of God. Gospel peddlers, hucksters of the truth. You know, a peddler is somebody who sells stolen goods or rips off their customer. A peddler, a hawker. They just make a buck off of the person they're selling to. I remember uh, one time in Chicago when I was, I was probably 19 years old, pretty ignorant, a uh, guy was selling some electronic equipment or whatever. He's like, hey, you want to see some electronic equipment? Me and my buddy were like, yeah, sure, why not? You know? and, it, and so we go in there, and next thing I know, we're in this like, dark like, entryway to some uh, apartment building, and uh, this long conversation ensues about you know, if, if we like the speakers that he has, if we're going to pay him, and we're like, well, sure, we would pay you if we like him. We just want to see what you have. And he's like, well, do you have the money on you? you know? and it, this whole thing ends up with like, him literally getting angry, and he starts to reach into his coat. And uh, I'm not, I'm no thug, but I'm like, I was about ready to hit the guy. I thought he was going to pull a gun on me. Now that's, when I think of a peddler, I'm like, that's, that's my guy. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the peddler. <laughs> He's got something up his sleeve. He's trying to get something out of you. But when it comes to gospel peddlers, they are never selling electronics on the streets of Chicago with a gun up there in their coat. What are they doing? They're peddling truth. They're peddling the gospel. They have the appearance of religion. To Christ, to God, they smell 
They smell like death. To those who are being saved, they smell like death. But to those who are perishing, they smell like life. It becomes important to realize peddlers are a dime a dozen. There's only a few tactics that they have. Gospel peddlers will often appeal to numbers, popularity, and influential endorsement. They get pats on the back to create a good old boy club where one can endorse the other, and then the numbers of followers, by way of books and YouTube followers and subscribers and everything else, becomes the very proof of their fidelity. That's very contra to Paul. Notice in chapter 3, verse 1, which is for another day, but it's worth reading at this particular point. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? Gospel peddlers are always looking to horizontal affirmations for their ministry. Gospel peddlers will use a disguise. They conceal that they're making the word of God more attractive to sinners. Whereas Paul, in chapter 4, verse 2, says, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame. And... Gospel peddlers are always pragmatic. They use whatever tactic works. Paul says we do not walk in craftiness in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. Gospel peddlers use the word of God. They just adulterate it and water it down with error. And that's what Paul renounces in chapter 4, verse 2c. Nor do we adulterate the word of God. They also promote themselves, which is the opposite of what Paul did, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Um... Uh, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord for your bondserv- as, as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. That's a good question, question right there, a good, good test. When you, hear some, when you hear a human preaching, do you learn more about God and his word, or do you learn more about the guy? Is it more full of anecdotes, <laughs> more full of personal preferences, or more full of truth being made clear and the implications of a passage for your life being sobered in your senses. Gospel peddlers ruin holiness. They promote carnality. Paul talks about all of that in chapters 6 and 7 and 12 of this book. They talk about Jesus. It's just the wrong Jesus. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4. And they don't confront sin. Or if they do, they confront the popular ones, the acceptable sins that The society rejects, and that becomes the only sin that they'll preach against. The irony here is the gospel peddlers are trying to improve ministry, and so they tamper with the scent, and they always make it worse. The smell of Christ is unimprovable. All you can do is start to smell good to those who are perishing and smell bad to those who are being saved. If that's not Paul's ministry, what is Paul's ministry? 17b, he says, But as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. As from sincerity. Sincerity has to do with the the purity of the motive. And it's interesting, the word sincerity in English comes from the Latin, sinacera, which would mean without wax, because when they would sell pots, they would sell it as waterproof, and uh, they would wax it if there was cracks. They would just put wax in it, so it would hold water for the sale, and then, you know, over time, and as it gets hot, it would melt, and it, wouldn't, it would leak, and oh, that's a waste. So selling it without wax is a, is, means it's bona fide, it's sincere, it's the real deal, it's the genuine article. And it's interesting that in, in the Greek word, which we don't really have an equivalent for, it actually is a compound word that means judged by the sun. Judged by the sun. You could hold it up to light or by the sun's heat. You would test and see whether there was wax, whether it was whether it was the real deal or not. He says, as from sincerity, we have pure motives. He even says in, in 1 Thess chapter 2, uh, we speak not to please men, but God who has entrusted the gospel to us. He's seeking the approval of God in his very ministry. There is a sincere motive. He does not ultimately care how people respond, though he's burdened by it. That is not his motive. His speech is governed by one concern, An audience of one. As from sincerity, as from God. I'm speaking the words God gave me to say. And friend, spouse, son, daughter, co-worker, distant relative. I'm saying this because I love you. I know it's horribly indicting and hard to hear. I'm saying this because I I care about you. 
you need to hear this truth. I got it from God, and I must hand it to you untampered with. That's his sincerity. That's speaking as from God, speaking in Christ in the sight of God. Every utterance evaluated by what, what does God think of that? Well, I want to just ask you if, to really answer a few questions. When you evaluate whether you smell like Christ and you consider your life and your message before the Lord, ask yourself a few questions. Ask yourself this. Does my life prove the gospel? Does the way that I live, does it prove the gospel? Can I say that my, my ministry is sincere? Has it been rendered before God? Is it from God? Is it in his sight? I'm not asking you to evaluate whether you're, it proves the gospel perfectly. It proves the gospel when you fail by your confession and when you succeed by boasting in Christ and showing how the victory was his because of the truth. So by your victory and by your confession, does your life prove the gospel to this person that you're thinking of and maybe you've been thinking of through this whole sermon? Ask yourself this question. Was your speech bold and clear before the Lord or was it hindered and hampered by the fear of man? Ask yourself this question. What is the stronger fear? Losing this relationship or being faithful before the Lord? And ask yourself this question. Did or does the lack of fruit um, show or reflect disobedience to the Lord in other areas of my life? And just ask yourself, have I been faithful, imperfectly faithful, to confess my sins and to demonstrate the power of the gospel? And if you have, you smell like Christ. Thank God. The unbelief of your children or spouse, the unbelief of your coworkers, it's not on you if you smell like Christ. Praise the Lord, you smell like Christ. Thank him, you smell like Christ. That's how you continue ministering faithfully in a, min in a chapter of ministry when it's particularly difficult. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for encouragement we received from Paul. Paul experienced the burden of laboring when there was no apparent fruit on the horizon. And Lord, the fact that we get to read this letter and especially focus on this paragraph and learn what it means to give thanks to you in those hard seasons is incredibly helpful. Lord, we want to just begin by confessing any lack of gratitude in hard seasons, knowing that um, you're not worthy of that kind of treatment and that kind of sin is, is very gross to you and we long to be forgiven for any cynicism, uh, seasons of uh, difficult seasons of ministry. And Lord, we also just want to thank you for the privilege of being pleasing to you by smelling like Christ. I pray that we would smell like Christ all our days. I just pray that this congregation would always smell like Christ, that we would continue to smell more and more like Christ, and that we would never tamper with the scent, but that we would always be content to just be pleasing to you. And Lord, as a result, seeing this battle won in our heart to be more grateful for faithfulness than fruitfulness, no doubt you will produce fruitfulness, and you always do, but we want to leave that in your hands. We want to lay these burdens down at your feet, wherever we have anxiety and worry and concern about fruit, whether that's conversion or growth, we just want to leave that at your feet, and we want to pray, Lord, that we would be consumed with being grateful to you in dark seasons. Uh, you're worthy of that kind of praise, you're worthy of that kind of gratitude and that kind of honor, and thank you for showing us how it's done through the Apostle Paul. In your name we pray.